If you will, open your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs chapter 30 would be the first place we look this morning. I think I had received the flyer for the West End meeting, and uh, unfortunately I did not print that off and give it to Mac. The meeting times for today, they have a 3 o'clock sing and a 4 o'clock worship service. It is 7.30 Monday through Friday, and the speaker is Jamie Hines. He is a friend of mine from Florida, actually. He is now living down near Miami area. And uh, if you get the chance to go over there, I'm sure they would greatly appreciate you spending the time to go and do so. Um, we'll be looking here in Proverbs chapter 30, down in verse 8 and in verse 9. It is October. This is the month where we begin all of the preparation to, to thank God for all of the blessings we have. And it brought to mind here this verse. In verse 8 and verse 9, um, the proverb writer writes, Remove far from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane in the name of my God. And if you will kind of turn with me real quick to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. There are several passages in the Bible that deal with the concept that if we have too much, we have a tendency to forget the one who gave so much. God had promised the Israelites that if they obeyed him, he would give them a land that flowed with milk and honey. And here in chapter 6, he describes what they should do as they enter into the land. Has to be, should teach their children diligently, and that their children should teach their children diligently to remember God. And if you're there in verse uh, 10 down through verse 12, he says, When the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give you, with great and good cities that you did not build, and houses full of good things that you did not fill, and cisterns that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant. And when you eat and you are full, take care lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of slavery. It is the Lord your God who you shall fear. He reminds them as you, as you are overly abundantly supplied with all the great things in life, you're going to have a tendency to forget. In fact, the later part of chapter 6 is the statement that you will forget, and this is what's going to happen when you do forget. And this is the, the lesson that's been taught all of my life. And I don't mean that in a bad way. It is an excellent lesson that needs to be taught. And especially around October time, it kind of comes to mind. I know that uh, over the years we've done various things with the kids where we've done uh, write your blessings on the leaf and put it up on the wall. You make a, a, a tree by the end of the year or put it in a pumpkin, or all the different ideas that you have to remind yourselves on a daily basis through October and November, all the blessings that you have. It's the time of year when we begin to count those things. But I want to look at a different idea, the, the second part of Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 8 and 9. But turn with me to Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1. Our lives are, are full of blessings. We have so many good things. And even when things seem to be going bad, things are still usually going pretty good. It's kind of like pizza. Even bad pizza is pretty good because it's still pizza. And not to sound you know, too, too proud of being an American, even when things are going pretty bad as being American, it's still pretty good because we're an American. I think we had looked a couple weeks ago on the topic of how much is enough for us to be thankful and, and grateful from God. And the estimate is that over 80% of the world's population lives on less than $10 a day. Average American wage is somewhere in the neighborhood of $120 a day. We make the, the wages of 12 people every day on average. We live far more abundantly than we ever need. But sometimes, as we get to hear to Job, Job is a man who, like us, has far more abundantly than he needs. And Satan presents himself before God, and he says, Have you considered, and God says, Have you considered my servant Job? And Satan says that he only serves you because you have hedged him in with all the good things in life. You have built him up with so much good that whenever he doesn't have the good, he'll forget you or he'll curse you. And that's what happens. In what seems to be the, the worst turn of events in human history, almost, 
that as one messenger comes and tells him he has lost this portion of his property, another one comes and tells him he's lost the other portion of his property, and then the other portion of the property, and then his family. And here in verse 20, Job chapter 1, Job arose and he tore his robes and he shaved his head and he fell on the ground and he worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's a much harder concept, I think. It is easy to forget God in the good times. And it's easy to want to curse God in the hard times. It is easy to want to bless the God who has given and sometimes much harder to want to bless the God who has taken away. And yet this is the attitude that singles Job out in the Bible. Naked I came, naked shall I return. The Lord has given and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Here in chapter 2, Satan and God have another exchange where he says that a man will do anything for his own life. Skin for skin, all that a man has, he will give for his own life. There in verse 4. So he takes away his health. And his wife here in verse 9 says, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. And Job answered her, You speak as one of the foolish women speak. Shall we receive good from the Lord? And shall we not also receive evil? And in all this, Job did not sin with his lips. The term that's used there for evil is not the idea of of sinfulness or things that are wicked, but it's the idea of tragedy or calamity. Shall we not receive prosperity and calamity? How low must Job have been? We see here, as we get to the end of chapter 2, that his friends, uh, being good friends, lacked all of the words to comfort and simply sat with him for days on end in his misery. How low and how miserable would you be in this point? And yet the two most profound statements we see in the first couple of chapters is the Lord has given, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. His first response was to worship. And here in chapter 2, the idea that shall we not receive calamity or, or evil from God? Turn me to Romans chapter 8 years ago that to have three-point lessons, I'm going to abandon everything that I was taught. I have a one-point lesson this morning. Brevity is going to be the key for today. Here in Romans chapter 8, Paul kind of outlines this idea in these last couple verses of chapter 8 and asks us line by line, what is it that's going in your life right now that's going to cause you not to love God or not to praise and not to worship Him? What is going to separate you from the love of God? So he asks the question there in verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And that can be taken two ways. One is, what is going to prove to you in your life that God no longer loves you or Christ no longer loves you? Or, what is going to steal your heart away? What is going to give, what is, what's going to take to happen in your life in order for you to no longer love God? Shall tribulation or distress? There's a lot of things that are simply just hard in life. It's not necessarily anybody out to get us. It's not necessarily... Uh, a whole series of events that are just going to be the worst thing in the world. It's just hardships. And sometimes it's, it comes in threes, sometimes it seems it comes like in twenties. But hardships come in life. And it's the all, sometimes it's all the small things that stack up. You say, I can handle this, I can handle this, and this one. But put them all three together and it just gets to be too much. At what point in time do you say, I've had enough? Why would God do this to me? Shall tribulations or distress or persecutions? We've been blessed in this country where overt persecutions have not been the case, but subvert persecutions have been. Is that going to persuade us to no longer love God? How about famine or nakedness? The very core, basic needs of human existence. Even Jesus points out in Matthew chapter 6, with food and clothing, we shall be content. Or Paul mentions that over, sorry, 1 Timothy chapter 6. We'll get the passages right eventually. Food and clothing, we shall be content, content. And yet here he mentions, what if you are on the very brink of not having food or clothing? 
is that going to persuade you to no longer worship and bless God? What if it's danger? Many people suffer all kinds of violence in this life. And maybe after suffering of violence, they feel the, the ever presence of danger or insecurity where there's never enough locks on the door, there's never enough light around the house. Is that feeling of, of danger or insecurity, is that going to do it? What if someone attacks with a weapon? He mentions a sword here, that would be kind of the their day and age gun. What if someone attacks with a gun? Would that, would that do it for you? Is that the point in time where you stop worshiping and praising and blessing God? He says here in verse 36, as is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. In verse 37, he says, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We're conquerors through all of those things. What if you faced one of them? Tribulations or distress or persecutions or maybe even danger or sword or nakedness or famine. But what if you suffered all of them? Paul still describes this in verse 37 as being more than conquerors. How about in verse 38, for I am sure that neither death. I watched an interview recently of a lady who had lost her husband. He was a, a preacher. They were having an uh, event going on at one of the members' house. And so they had taken chairs and tables out. And after the event was done, he had loaded the chairs and tables up in his truck and we were taking him back. Uh, his wife was falling in a different vehicle. On the way back, he noticed a vehicle that was broken down the side of the road. So being the guy that he was, decided to pull over and see if he could help. While he was standing there with the two drivers, or the driver of the vehicle, um, a drunk driver came along and killed both of them. His wife came upon the scene minutes after he was struck. And she said that as she ran up to the accident scene, she thought in her mind, God surely couldn't do this to me. People lose faith when they lose other people in their life. Paul asks that question, or makes the statement, that I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor things to come, nor powers. And all of these things will be able to separate us from the love of Christ Jesus. Sometimes we think, well, we're, there's, we're doing too much right to suffer this much wrong. We are trying too hard to go through this much negative. And all of those things could be easily said about Job. A man who had faith like nobody else in the rest of the world. That, there's, that God singled him out and said, Have you considered my servant Job that there's nobody else who is doing as much good as he is? Yet God chose to allow that to happen to him. For whatever his inscrutable reasons were, whatever purposes for Job or for us, Job being ignorant of all the, the, the private conversations that we are privy to, Job says, God has given, and God has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Shall we not receive good and evil? So he makes the point of, towards the end of chapter 8. Nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. None of these things should tear our hearts away, though they try desperately to. Paul, being the author of Romans, also writes towards the end of 2 Corinthians there in chapter 11. After writing of nakedness and hunger and persecutions and famines and dangers, he recounts for the Corinthians that he's been through not one of those or two of those things, but pretty much the entire list of things. And notice how he describes himself by the end of this passage. We, under, we, we always begin there in verse 20, 24, so let's go ahead and begin there as normal. He says, five times I received at the hands of the Jews 40 lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked, and night and the day I was adrift at sea, on frequent journeys, in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, and dangers from the Gentiles. I was in danger in the city, and danger in the wilderness, dangers at sea, and danger from my false brethren, in toil and hardship, 
through many sleepless nights in hunger and in thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from all of these things, there is the daily pressures on me of my anxieties for all the churches. Who is weak? Am I not weak? Paul, after suffering all the things he suffered, doesn't describe himself as, as being stronger through it all. He describes himself as being weak. He'll take that same concept as you move down into chapter 12 and talk about one particular weakness, that thorn in the flesh. He makes this point in verse 8 of chapter 12, the three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. Paul, I wonder how many times that he, he pleaded for all these other things to stop. The beatings, the stonings, the whippings, the, the dangers from all of this. We aren't told any of that. What, he's told, what we're told is there in chapter 12, whatever this saw in the flesh, that seemed to be, in his mind, too much. This is the point where Paul was on the verge of breaking, it seems like. When this happened, I'm not sure. He makes points other times that he doesn't want the brethren to be unaware of what he suffered in Asia. That he was so burdened beyond his ability that he despaired of life itself. Maybe it was at this time that Paul is speaking. That's only a speculation, but he says that he pleaded with the Lord three times. Now, notice what he says there in verse 9. Jesus replied to him, says, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly in my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest, rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, that I am content with weaknesses and insults and hardships and persecutions and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The things we mentioned about Job, a man who says, shall we not also receive evil or calamities from God? It's the same idea, same wording that's phrased there in verse 10, that Paul says, I will be content with these things. The mindset of praising God for the things that he has blessed us with, I think, is the, the easier of the two mindsets. Yet there are so many occasions in the, in the Old Testament and the New Testament where we see individuals who are facing either the consequences of their action or just life events who, through their suffering and hardship, pause and worship God. And that is a huge point for our lives, for us to understand about our lives. Our natural knee-jerk reaction when we were are abundantly blessed is to forget the one who blesses. And our knee-jerk reaction when things go wrong and, and we have things taken away out of our lives is to rebuke the one who's taken it away. To lash out in anger or resentment or fear or distrust. And yet what we are told is that we are to bless the Lord who gives and the Lord who takes away. Remember that we should receive both good and bad from his hand if he so chooses. Understanding that as we were looking there in Romans chapter 8, that all things work together for good. Now, we don't understand how or when or why, and that takes faith, and that's hard. It's hard to say that God has taken away now, and I'm suffering now. But blessed be the name of the Lord, and all things will work together for good. How and when and why? We aren't told ahead of time. What is our job and our responsibility it is our duty. And what is absolutely best for us is to play, praise the God that both gives and takes away. So this week, I want us to take some, some time. I want us to make the words from Job chapter 1 to be Job's that are, are words that are, are readily on our lips whenever calamity comes. Whenever we have things that are removed from our life, the things that we love and care for and cherish and depend upon the most. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord has given and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I think that those are words that the Bible has, that God has put in the Bible for us to, to make our own words, to make our own response to the hardships of life. Then this is picked up number 620. you have let hardships or calamities keep you from your love of God or your faithfulness to him, if you have let hardships drive you away from him and you need to pray
prayers of the congregation or the encouragement from other Christians. If there's anything we can do for you to help you to become more faithful to God, let us know as we stand and sing number 620. Would you live